Hey there, welcome to Over the Horizon. We did a very interesting chat with uh, Scott Walter, uh, Dr. Ed Pope, and uh, Ozan Belik a couple of weeks back on Starship IFT3. There's been a great amount of uh, of reaction to it on LinkedIn, on uh, on X, and on YouTube. And we thought we'd get together uh, now that we're looking at uh, IFT4 for Starship, perhaps around the first week of May, put our heads together, look at uh, what we've come to know, try and understand a bit of uh, where we're headed with uh, with IFT4. So let me get on the stars. Uh, back with us again, Scott Walter, Ozan Belik, and Ed Pope. Great to have you guys back. Um, let's just begin very quickly with this very interesting soundbite from Gwyn Shotwell. Of, uh, uh, she was at the satellite conference around the 11th of March, and this is what she had to say. Through the data, uh, the team got to take the weekend off, <laughs> which they deserved. Um, we're still going through the data. Uh, it was an incredibly successful flight, obviously. We hit exactly where we wanted to go. It was not an orbital flight with purpose. Um, we wanted to make sure we could passively come back on a, you know, a trajectory that we could count on if we didn't relight the second the second stage engine a second time, basically, to re-enter. But boost stage was beautiful. Uh, in fact, we got, the, um, we got the, the relight of the booster engines to come back. Um, we didn't complete that, that part of the phase either, but uh, ascent phase was beautiful for both stages. And then um, we'll figure out what happened on both stages as well and get back to flight, hopefully in about six weeks, flight four, hopefully. At the beginning part of May, and uh, I don't think we're going to deploy satellites on the next flight. Things are still in trade, but I think we're really going to focus on getting re-entry right um, and, and making sure we can land these things where we want to land them successfully. All right, so there's a lot of hope there. Um, I guess they've taken stock. Uh, let me just start off with a quick uh, roundup. I'll start with you, Scott. Do you think we're on track for perhaps the first week of May for IFT4? It sounds like it. I know she first said something like that six weeks, and then everyone's thinking that late April because it was a few weeks before. I don't know if this is another conference. And I think Elon also says something about early May. So it seems like they're going for that. Everyone thinks it's going to be the you know May the 4th. So May the 4th be with you. But that's a Saturday. Yeah. And so they, don't, they tend to not do it on that. I'm going for May Day. Or May Day, the first is spelled with a uh, an E at the end of May. Ah, oh, okay. Right. Uh, but the, the one thing about that is he said, I don't think we're going to deploy satellites on this one. And to, to me, yeah. it's like there seems to be a, a bit of debate on whether they have progressed enough that they could potentially do that. So mm. that's a very hopeful sign to me right there that, you know, it's like, I don't think they must have really given it careful thought and said, ah, we're not quite there yet, but. You know, if we nail this, they're probably going to do it on, on the mission after that. Right. And I think that, you know, um, Ozan, I think that 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 struck me that, you know, the focus for IFT4 would be getting Starship back uh, mm -hmm. in, in a much better kind of a landing sequence. Will probably be a water landing, not on one of those uh, drove ships that they have. Yeah. But um, the focus seems to have shifted a bit, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's an interesting comment. Uh, I think she <clears throat> sidestepped a little bit the issue of engine relight, um, mm -hmm. and I think that that's that would be the key reason not to deploy Starlinks, right? Um, if you can get up there, which they can, you can deploy Starlinks. It doesn't matter whether you can come back or not. Like it doesn't it doesn't really change the calculus for 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 coming back, with one possible exception. If they're not if they're concerned about the uh, the dispenser door staying closed right. and when what effect that has on re-entry. But I, I I feel like they they probably wouldn't make that trade. I mean they might, they might. Maybe if, if they want to just get this out the door and like they don't want to do fixes and they, they and there's some actual concern about that. Uh it's possible that that's influencing the decision, but I would expect that it's more about um doing that relight. Uh and and I mean maybe maybe that's something where like given that they were not able to demonstrate engine relight on on this one what i would expect if they were going for a starlink deployment on the next one is that they would uh again insert into a suborbital trajectory and then do a relight to uh, raise the the perigee to a starlink deployment orbit uh with the hope that they would be able to relight a third time to, to 
to the um, the orbit burn. So uh, yeah. if they if that second one succeeds, and then then it's possible that they might be in a situation where um, coming back where they want to come back would be a little bit more difficult. So that that's that might be another concern for um, yeah. Starlink deployment. And, the, and of course, the other thing is uh, the inclination. Right. If you're launching out of Texas, you kind of have to do a little bit of a dog leg to. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure if there's a good path through the uh, Caribbean. I mean, you, you do have to fly uh, overland a little bit if you're not, uh, you know, kind of going between the islands. Uh, and that that's, you know, between Florida and, and Cuba is kind of uh, where you want to aim if you want your flight track to be completely over over the water. I think they will be able to target other inclinations without a without a dog leg. But and it's just a little bit more complicated um mm. so all right we, we we'll we'll get into the in, into the weeds uh in just a bit but and i just want a quick reaction um do you have you changed your mind last time we were talking about the material science of the tiles right and right. whether they're the right right selection for what would be needed for starship uh we don't seem to have seen any major change so far do you think it's perhaps do you want to revisit your analysis well, I, I still believe that it's a poor selection, not only of the material, but of the way they attach the material. And the two are, you know, some people say uh, in response to my comment, well, it's not the material, it's the attachment. Well, okay, it's like a marriage. You, unless you want in a divorce, you can't take the two apart from one another because the strength and toughness, durability of the material directly determines what kind of attachment schemes, mechanisms you can utilize. And mm -hmm. the space shuttle tile material is a great material for its day, but it is inherently weak. And as a result, it's difficult and it always has been difficult to attach correctly. And, and you know, in IFT3, we saw different things that are of concern. Uh, first of all, the material never got tested in IFT3 because of, well, bigger issues that occurred. Uh, uh, just and, and these have not yet been fully explained, but if we use this as, this is a F35, but if we use it, as an example of the orbiter, uh, I have this because I worked on this vehicle way back then. If we use this as an example of the orbiter, it was supposed to come in at a certain angle, about 40 degrees, and re-enter the atmosphere. Terrific. That's the way they designed it. It did do things that were anomalous. Uh, yeah. It rolled so that it started coming in upside down. And then... <laughs> its whole angle changed so that it was entering the atmosphere, shall we say, ass forward. Well, it was not designed to do that. So it came in upside down, ass forward into re-entry. And of course, no matter what the heat shield material was, uh, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, because, you know, they and they haven't quite fully explained what happened, but, you know, from an aerodynamic standpoint, you have to be concerned with center of gravity, center of dynamic pressure, speculation. Did they move fuel from one tank to another? Did it change the center of gravity, which is why it did what it did? Uh, it could be. And they, you know, they need to uh, look at that. Uh, another question is on their orbiter, Starship orbiter. It has these flaps on the front. Could those have altered its uh, aerodynamics such that it would uh, not enter at the right angle, and, you know, right pitch and so forth? So they're going to relaunch. Let's uh, assume for the sake of discussion that they fix those problems and it does enter the atmosphere at the angle of attack they want, and all of that is fine. Now you test the robustness of the actual heat shield that they picked. Um, 
the space shuttle tiles from which Starship's tiles are modeled are very weak material. They were very difficult to attach. Many did fall off, fortunately not in strategic areas. Uh, and there are better materials out there today. I mean, we're talking 50 years later. The shuttle tiles were invented, developed in the early 1970s at uh, Skunk Works when it was in Burbank. But uh, it's a parasitic heat shield. And the concern from IFT3 is that many of the tiles on the vehicle were damaged before launch, uh, staffing it. Uh, during launch, many tiles fell off. As I wrote in my article on LinkedIn, it spawned a whole boutique industry of people selling Starship tile souvenirs on eBay. So there's a lot of them to go around, unfortunately. And so that begs the question that, well, if in IFT4, they're able to start re-entering the atmosphere, but they have similar problems. Yeah, there's the article. There's the post. Uh, similar problems with keeping the tiles attached to the vehicle uh, during stacking and on boost and launch, then, you know, obviously, if you don't have your material attached to the vehicle, it's not going to protect it. I mean, that's the whole point. It's got to stay on the vehicle. And I think that's where um, there's been a tremendous missed opportunity. There are newer materials developed in the 21st century to deal with these 21st century challenges. And, uh, you know, this material, the NASA shuttle material, was rated at 2300 Fahrenheit, uh, which was enough for the shuttle, uh, but it's not rated at more than that. It's a silicate-based material, so obviously if you get it too hot, it will melt. That's why it's not on the nose tip of the shuttle, it's not on the leading edges of the shuttle. They use something uh, refractory carbon-carbon, which is a silicon carbide coated carbon-carbon for the nose tip. And the, uh, uh, leading edge. So if uh, if IFT4 goes very well uh, to the point where it can re-enter at the angle of attack that it's designed to do so, uh, then we get a, ro a real test of their heat shield strategy and how effective it is. And I'm, I'm very concerned uh, with this uh, aspect of the design. I think the design of the vehicle itself is much more challenging than the shuttle. Uh, the shuttle did not have uh, active uh, components on the forward section of the vehicle. You didn't have actuated fins uh, and right. things like that that also need protecting. Yeah, there are um, a lot of moving parts. And each, yeah. each additional moving part is a failure point that you add to it. Yeah, and how do you protect those joints yeah. effectively? Uh, I mean, there's so many questions about this. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. So let me let me just get back to um, something that you posted a few a couple of weeks back, Scott. I think um, let me just pull it up. This was after you went on uh, Ellie's show, was it? Um, that you you guys came across um, a few heat tiles that were yeah, found. That that was a, a few days after uh, right. our, our last uh, sort of discussion about that, right. in which um, there was still a lot of unknowns at that point. And uh, Ellie had a, a friend uh, down in Boca Chica who lives nearby, and he was able to collect a lot of heat tiles on the beach. And so I was able to ask him a bunch of questions. And it sort of changed my opinion a little bit about um, what was going on. And my, at first, I was sort of the impression that the tiles were breaking off, that they were they were just kind of failing and break and, and literally breaking off because they couldn't handle the aerodynamic loads. And it looks like they weren't so much breaking off as they were falling off. And the reason yeah. why I've taken this is that he recovered a lot of intact ones. And the ones that yeah. they found that were actually were in pieces, they were in pieces because either people riding horses or driving dune buggies drove over them and didn't see them. 
And so and they're very weak. Okay. They will yeah, break. Yeah. So when that happens, yeah, that's going to happen. But somehow they they didn't like fracture and fall off. And but they if they fell off, they made it to the ocean. They made it in through the surf. So they're like they're tough enough to wash up. Mm. It's just not tough enough to have someone step on it. So then it says like, yeah. okay, then there's something wrong with the attachment point. And I didn't understand how the attachment points were working. I was assuming well. It's almost like drywall, right? You, you you put an anchor in drywall, and if you get the wrong anchor, it just like tears out of the drywall. And what yeah. it looks like when we look at the back, it looks like they've actually baked it in. So it looks like they probably have some rather, I would say, pieces that are rectangular in shape that are pretty big that are, are in there. They're not drilling the holes after the fact or doing anything to weaken the material. They make the material that way. And right. those brackets that they kind of get back there can act as like a little stiffener. Now, I wasn't sure if it was a full Y. They came through, but because they could make a Y and that would make it really strong. But it turns out they're not doing that because yeah. there was like another broken tile that showed that. Well, wait a minute. If it was a Y, it shouldn't have broken or it should be yeah. a piece of, of metal jutting out. So you know, they uh, that, they started putting plates in. Uh, yeah. Between so the those, tile those plates. The... Yes. So so they give rigidity to the tile and the plate will be a much better point to grab a hold of because now you're distributing the load over a larger area. The problem is that they get a little slot that they've got something clicking into. Now, this is an old picture, and I think they've improved it. But when I looked at it, I just kind of joked. It's like, my God, it looks like they're using bobby pins. You know, so something that just kind of goes in and just sort of clicks in and uses a little bit of, of a, a springiness to lock in. And that's really tricky to make sure that the mechanism has locked because we all know what it's like trying to do those things. And you're trying to do, what, 18,000 of these things? They got three each, and you're trying to get in there and, like, click, click. Do they all go in? And, and then the other thing is like with thermal expansion and vibration, how good is it working? So it seems to me it's like that mechanical interlock could be what's failing because, and they must be almost failing at the same time. Cause I would think if one of them is like really holding on for dear life and the other two have somehow detached, if you get like an aerodynamic loading on there, then that should tear it off. Then, 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 then you should see the tile breaking in half. And if, if we're seeing a lot of them kind of breaking up like that, and I was expecting to see that if the pins were getting torn out, they should be attached. But I think the pins are staying stuck to the skin. And for some reason, that locking mechanism is not working right. And maybe yeah. they're aware of that. Maybe they know that's a problem. So my conclusion is like, if those darn things would stay on and not fall off so easily, they might be able to make it through a reentry. They, they might actually be tough enough to handle that in 80 to 90 percent you know what's happening around the leading edge that could be something else because those are, are tricky areas but it's just sort of like i think the tiling will do its job if it will just stay on well that's exactly right and the reason it won't stay on is it's so weak that it's very difficult to attach the tile securely i mean they borrowed the tile uh material from the shuttle days the nasa days and that, uh, I'm fine. It's flown. It worked very well for the shuttle. Uh, but they didn't borrow the way NASA attached them. I mean, they the undersurface of the tiles was flat and smooth, and they used a, a silicone resin uh, based adhesive. And the key was because the material is weak, they uh, they made the attachment, the resin bonding, the glue. Uh, using a felt, a squishy felt, so that it could adapt to any surface roughness on the underside of the tile to maximize the surface area of interaction between the skin of the vehicle and the tile to maximize its adhesion, recognizing that you can't bolt it or pin it in. I mean, if you have a strong material like this, you can use... Uh, any number of fastener schemes. This is a, these are bolts. Well, bolts are fine. This is a thousand pounds of, of load on each fastener. And this little strike has four of them. Well, you can't do that with shuttle tile because it's uh, too weak. And, and that's where, you know, cause and effect, you need a, uh, for, particularly for this design of vehicle, you need uh, a better material um, because you're not going to be able to fix it. And these pins that they're using uh, have a small surface area in contact with each tile. And 
The tile material is very weak and friable. If you've ever held it in your hand and, and uh, pushed on it, it's so soft and it breaks up into dust, fine dust. So where the tile would come off on the shuttle was at the interface between the adhesive glue, the silicone-based resin, and uh, the tile. But fortunately, there was enough to keep it on. And the design of the shuttle was much more conservative than what Musk has. So I, I still think he is likely to have a serious problem with a heat shield failure uh, on IFT4 if they fix their other issues. So if I may add a couple of... Uh, couple of yeah, uh, Ozan, I just, bef before you do, you, okay. had, you had a response um, to, to Scott's uh, tweet, and I'm just going to pull that up, a post on X. Yeah. Um, you suggested a four-way mechanism. Can yeah, you I can maybe... get to that. Yeah, yeah I, I want to I want to address a couple of the points that have been brought up first. Uh, so, so one of the things I, I want to um, talk about the the strength of the material. Uh, so, I, I know that it's it's basically the same material as as the sh the shuttle the TPS material, but my understanding and Scott, I mean, you've also held the the tiles, right? Um, uh, no, no, I have. I've only seen them. I, okay, I you've only them. seen them. My impression is that they are not uh, the same density as the shuttle tiles, and and with you know silica um, aerated silica, you, you know the, the that density makes a big difference in the strength of the material. So it's, it's still not strong, but it's not. My impression was that it's not nearly as brittle and fragile as the, the shuttle tiles. So so that um, it might be the case that. Uh, this attachment mechanism or something along these lines is not quite so unreasonable as it, it would be uh, for shuttle uh, tiles. Well, another thing I, I wanted to go back to what Scott was uh, saying about the pins all failing at the same time. Um, I think it, it is a possibility with this kind of attachment mechanism that if one of them fails, the aerodynamic forces beyond just carrying it, it could they could wiggle it out yeah right? yeah they could and, cause and, a failure that, that that doesn't necessarily break the tile but it's it's still like yeah uh, wiggles out the other two the the um the starlink spacex tiles are modeled after the shuttle tiles they did do some changing to the formulation make it a little less uh porous a little slightly higher density but the proof of the pudding is in the tasting as my old professor used to say and they won't stay on uh stronger than what nasa used. they're not breaking off right they're not, well I mean, that seems to be the case well i mean it's it's basically it's going to fail at the weakest link and clearly the attachment is uh, scheme is the weakest link the other problem you have is when one falls off like they couldn't even stack the vehicle onto the starship at the launch site without losing tiles. I mean, they were falling off the vehicle and they have documented evidence of this. Sure. Then lots of them fell off uh, during launch. And, and part of the problem is once you lose a tile or two here and there, you have what NASA was very worried about. And that's called the zipper effect. Once one's gone, you've got the forces acting on the side of the tile to push it off. You get a shear force on it. Yep. And NASA was very concerned about the zipper effect. They never really saw it in any of the 130 some odd uh, successful returns they had, even though they did lose a few of the tiles on the back end of the vehicle. Yeah, I believe, Ed, you, you posted uh, something to this effect on, on X. And this is a picture of them, of the tiles. Yeah, off. well, that's a that's a link to uh, to the the larger article on uh, right. LinkedIn, because right. X doesn't really allow you to post lengthy posts. It's it's more conducive to to uh, three a.m. tweets than it is to <laughs> research articles. Yes. Yeah, what, I'd like to just 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 uh, kind of. Um, uh, address what Ed's talking about with the the method of attachment can't exceed the underlying strength of the material that you have. Right. So we all know if you take duct tape and and put it on a metallic surface, 
the thing that's going to fail is the adhesive. So when you decide to pull the tape off, it basically comes off of that. Right. You put that on cardboard, you'll have a really strong bond there. But when you go to pull the duct tape off, it's not the duct tape that's failing. It's the cardboard that's failing. It's pulling off. Precisely. So yeah. So if you try to put adhesive on there, you can have the strongest adhesive in the world. But if it's got this thing, which and we all know, it's like if you put scotch tape onto clothing or something like that, it comes off really easy and it pulls some of the material with it. So the underlying material just doesn't have the strength to give you the grip that's going in there. That's so you're right. trying to decide, all right, we're going to make something that's going to attach, but we can't make it stronger than the underlying material. Otherwise, it's going to tear it apart. So yeah. that's kind of the conundrum that we're in. There's a like, well, we're going to make sure it's just strong enough to hold it on there, but not stronger to break the whole thing. And it looks like, I, I don't think it's that the the fasteners are weak. It's just a, whatever that they do to get the fasteners to lock in seems to be failing. So it might just be a simple mechanical design problem as opposed to a strength of material or anything else. Well, that, that's my take and, at this point. And again, just, just, see for those those, just for the benefit of those uh, uh, watching, just to be clear, what, what exactly is the underlying material right now? Okay, so they, they've got like metallic studs that are coming into what looks like a metal plate and it should be yeah. locking into that. And then that metal plate is basically baked into something that's like styrofoam, okay? And because it's all baked in, they didn't have to go out and drill anything. So hopefully the holes and everything are, are, are going to be able to kind of maintain consistency that you poke in through the holes to get something from behind. So it's kind of holding it a little bit behind to increase the, the gripping strength. And for some reason, the fasteners are like slipping off. They're not actually pulling the plate out because that's what I would think would be the failure point. Yeah. Right? The whole thing would crumble and would come out. So for some reason, that thing is just wiggling out. And it's like, ah, yeah. Kind of, it's, it's kind of like your, your Ethernet cable when you plug it in. If you don't click it just right, it's going to pop right out. But you should yeah. be able to well, click it, it is, in, and then it should be and, like really And the cause for this is, is... It actually is, doesn't is the, matter. Is the, sorry, is the yeah. cause for this vibration at, at the time of takeoff? It, vibration, heating, it could be a variety of things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it, the, okay. Ed, okay. Getting back to the fundamental point, the limitation on how you can attach it securely is based on the weakness of the material. A very robust material, you have many options to how to attach it uh, securely and strongly. These tiles are fabricated, molded. If you look at the underside of the tiles that were recovered, uh, those surfaces are smooth, those holes are molded in the tile when they're fabricated. The tiles are then attached to that, you know, metal arrow shell and uh, with the pins. Uh, but that is a molded surface. The tiles are not baked onto the uh, vehicle. Uh, they're they're fabricated in a in a tile factory. Elon Musk spent over one and a half billion dollars. Okay, uh, could you could you tell us more about the uh, the 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 cost of that? Because like I, I I haven't been able to find a uh, source for that. Uh, cost no, he, it, it's it was all over the media. I I can dig up articles on it from a few years ago. Okay, but, uh, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, but anyway, he makes them in his own facilities, and they are molded, and it's very clear they're molded just by looking uh, at the underside of it. So they're not baked on. The problem with the pins is the amount of surface area you have in contact with the whole tile is very small relative to its surface area. And if it's a weak material, all you've got is surface area of attachment to work with, which is why the NASA uh, approach to these tiles was to have flat under surfaces and glue them across the entire surface area, knowing that the material is inherently weak, but to get the highest load carrying capability of the tile, given its weakness, you attach it across the maximum surface area available, which is the entire surface area of the underside of the tile. Trying to attach it in only three or four spots uh, to pins uh, greatly reduces your, uh, your surface area that you've got to work with. And it's a weak material. And so they're falling off. I mean, uh, I don't, I mean, I think it is something that you might be able to make work 
with some re-engineering uh, at, at a great effort because you've got to go back, you've got to redesign your whole approach for the attachment. And then you've got parts of the vehicle where it, I don't believe this material is going to work at all. Like those, those fins on the forward section, that's going to be very challenging to get anything weak like this to stick. You need a tough, higher temperature structural heat shield. The, 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 the design of the shuttle tiles was to be a lightweight, low density, uh, but parasitic heat shield. It provides no structural support whatsoever to the vehicle. It just hangs on there to provide the thermal insulation that, that is needed, as long as it can hang on. Um, this reusability uh, that he would, that Musk would like to see at SpaceX, uh, begs for a different material, a stronger, tougher material. And if he's looking for not only Leo return, he's looking for lunar return, which is comes in much hotter and much faster, uh, then you need a higher temperature material. This material is only rated to 2300F. Uh, if you're going to come back from lunar return or one day he wants to do Mars return, which is comes in really fast, uh, and so re-entry is very high, uh, you're going to need a higher temperature material anyway. We'll see. IFT4 is going to be very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, so, yes, Ozan. Right, and I think you wanted me to talk about the uh, the four point attachment thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me just pull up your post on X for that. Cool. Yeah. So uh, you know, to Ed's point, uh, there are definitely uh, weaknesses to the material, uh, weakness to the uh, strategy going forward. Um, some of these decisions, I can, I can imagine um, some motivations for to why they've gone this this way um and some of the mitigations that they might have in mind for the future uh but just ref just in terms of the attachment problems that they're currently having um i think that one quick fix i mean it's not it's not really a quick fix right but it is it's not a complete overhaul so if, if they went from a three three point attachment to a, a four point so in, in the hexagonal tile you could have like a a, a you know a, a four point like X structure, you know, like a, a, a slanted X, right? Um, going across the tiles, uh, and and have four uh, four pins. Then, if one of them fails, then you still have three points holding that uh, that tile on. So you're not going to get the same, uh, nearly the same kind of forces that that will be trying to wiggle the tile loose. Uh, so single pin failure would be a lot less likely to cause problems um and that might reduce the the tile failure rate to acceptable levels without even necessarily fixing the pins themselves but you know you could fix the pins and that might be that might be enough but at the point where you have eighteen thousand tiles uh fifty four thousand pins um you know just just statistically it's not you know, not all of them are going to be manufactured perfectly, especially when you're trying to do it cheap and fast. Um, and yes, like they have robotic uh, uh, welding, robotic man manufacturing of all this stuff. But it's you, you know you're gonna you're gonna have their tolerances, and like statistically, you're gonna exceed these uh, tolerances some fraction of the time. And it's just a lot to put on on two pins. What you're what you really want to put on three pins. Um, in terms of tiles co coming off. Uh, want to talk about two things. One of them is that is that zipper effect. Uh, I think that it 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 sure is. It's always a, a risk, right, when you have a tile surface. But um, it might be a lot less of a risk with Starship than it was with the shuttle, because of the aspect ratio of those tiles. They're a lot. Um, they they have much more uh, surface area and they're a lot thinner, right? So so, so those lateral forces from a missing tile are going to be a lot less. And then and then the hexagonal uh, shape of the tiles, uh, it would be such that, uh, you know, they might a hold each other on better. And then you're not going to, you're not going to get these, uh, 
you're not going to get plasma going in an unbroken stream in the gaps between them. So it, it might be less of an issue. Um, aside from the zipper effect, the other thing is that it's not just the tiles, right? There's that matting underneath. So even if the tiles themselves fail, that might provide a sort of ablative layer. It's not supposed to be ablative, right? But it's, it, it is this matting that, that will likely ablate if it's exposed to, to plasma. Um, and that might provide enough protection for the steel skin that unlikely, in, unlikely uh, unlikely you think yeah it's not enough material and the it's not it's <clears throat> it has to insulate the vehicle sufficient that the payload doesn't get cooked uh, human or equipment and it's not designed for that it's too thin Right. No, ablative heat shields are are incredible and um, they can dissipate massive amounts of heat keeping the undersurface cool but they do have to be thick and so if you look at the heat shields for apollo and even the new or orion uh they're very thick sure uh, and a lot of material ablates in a very fast period of time when you have a thin yeah. layer yes it will behave ablatedly for a fraction of a second and then what now you've got metal skin uh coming in at, at temperatures way beyond its uh ability to tolerate and so so i mean if we think about pika that stuff ablates i think less than a centimeter on a on a dragon re-entry which has higher heat fluxes uh um, yeah. and and then the rest of it is for insulation and and uh, reserve right uh, yeah. But the backing here is steel, and it's good to about 700 Kelvin, and and possibly more if you're willing to uh, tolerate some some amount of skin damage. Uh, and in terms of the you know, cooking the payload, I don't think that when you have an operational payload that you're bringing back, that it will be that there won't be any insulation inside of the nose cone, right? I don't think that it'll be exposed directly to the, uh, you know, I don't think it's just going to be air and metal that's protecting it from the outside temperatures. Because I think that part of what they wanted to do with the steel is to take it to about as high of a temperature as they, as, as it could endure. Um, so for this particular configuration, it just might be enough that it survives re-entry with missing tiles, maybe even hundreds of missing tiles. Is my I, I'm just not ready to rule out the possibility, right? Uh, yeah. it, I wish that we could get camera views outside of the vehicle after re-entry to see, you know, <laughs> in the event that it's unlikely event that it survives. I wish we could see what it yeah. what, what that sort well, of stuff then like after. But wouldn't hopefully they, they, that they, they probably have infrared cameras. Wouldn't inside. that mean IFT IFT three had a catastrophic loss of of tiles? Not oh, just. I mean, I think yeah. IFT three. It wasn't even the tiles protecting. Yeah, yeah. At that it was, point. No, it, was, it was probably the orientation. Yeah. I, the the yeah. one thing I, I just want to point out is that um, obviously, if you lose a lot of tiles, it's a disaster. The question is, what happens if you lose one or two? Is that going to be catastrophic? And I don't think it will for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, stainless steel is is pretty tough to be able to take a certain amount of temperature, not 2300, but it can get up there. The other thing about stainless steel, it's a really good conductor of heat. And so what it will do is it will conduct a lot of that heat through. So the rest of this vehicle ends up becoming like a thermal mass a little bit. So it might be able to endure a little bit of that thermal shock to kind of pull that away. So, so if I... it was a material that was a really poor conductor, then that's gonna be like a blowtorch on it, and you're gonna be throw it through it in no time. So there's that one possibility in a small area. Now, if you get a I'm, bunch of I'm going afraid on, that like yeah. I'm gonna have to pop that balloon because uh yeah. I, I did I, I was hopeful in that direction as well, and I, I did the math on that, and it's it's just because of the the size of these tiles and the and how thin the skin is and the, yeah, the flux that you're getting, you know, you're getting on the order of like a few hundred kilowatts uh per square meter. 
Um, yeah, it just uh, does yeah. not work out. I mean, like it, it'll spread out some like uh, uh, millimeters, centimeters around the, the you know the hot spot, but it's not gonna it's not gonna dissipate effectively throughout. You'll also get some radiative, uh, uh, you know, radiative cooling on the inside, which you didn't get with the, the shuttle because like, well, I mean, but is... it's it's still not quite enough. Uh, I think that if you do have that exposure, the 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 one thing that that's like the saving grace of like a single tile failure is that you do have that little bit of depression, which is not much. And again, because of that aspect ratio, you don't have that much of the depression, but it might be like, depending on the, the location, it might be enough to, to save the skin. I don't know. Uh, but it's, I think if the tile fails, it really comes down to the matting, but you know, the matting has less that it needs to do because of the steel. Well, I mean, the matting behind it is, <clears throat> What a millimeter? I mean, it's no. I think it's like a couple of a couple of centimeters, maybe three centimeters. Because hmm. it's that, that, it's that white foamy looking layer. That's, that's part of the, the tile. Edge. That's the edge of the. No, tile. no, no. There's a there's a. If you uh, Royden, if you pull up that picture again, so they they both look white, and it's a little hard to tell them apart. But yeah, that that. <clears throat> so so the outside of the. So the tile does have a a white bottom, yeah. right? But the rim of it is black. It's, now, it's coated on the on, on the edges, and then underneath it is that white foamy looking matting. But that's that's actually okay. The black glaze that's applied to the tiles, because this mm -hmm. is what they did with the shuttle, was for the top surface on the shuttle tiles that had black glaze, and I used to have a bunch of them. Uh, the glaze only went halfway down the edge of the tile. So yeah. that at the lower half of the tile, what you saw was white. It looked exactly like this. But, I mean, you, you can see that here as well. You can see the black glaze going all the way to the back end of the tile. No, it does not. That's the whole point. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the point are are we not seeing the same thing? I mean, this is, this is the back end of the tile, right? And we see the black glaze come from the edge and, like, the the it's 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 looks like the coating has come and and contaminated a little bit of the of the back of the tile is, is i mean that's that's what it looks like to me i don't know if that's that's what you guys are seeing too or yeah, maybe if we pull up what, another what, whole tile it looks like to me is there, the it looks like there's a thick blanket underneath that in yeah. that shot and we just don't that shot's a couple years old so we don't know how relevant it is whether they've changed that, but it certainly seemed like they had a pretty thick blanket underneath yeah. it. But it yeah, I don't know if they apply it what, everywhere, but this they is do from Ellie's uh, video. This is yeah, yeah, this that's is that's a current so one. Is, that's a current one. That's a current one. The previous yeah. one of showing the attachment with the the studs that are coming out in there, you can see what appears to be whatever is the felt underlying. Yeah, this one. yeah. yeah. yeah that yep. one there, yep. and it almost this seems the to be one. the thickness of the tile itself. But, yeah. So, if yeah. that's the case, let's just say that's the case then that white felt material is cut to the same dimensions as each individual tile. Yeah. And, and what's happening is, uh, well, it's hard to say in this photograph, uh, clearly where you lose one, tiles, you lose both. <laughs> you, it, well, that's the thing. Yeah. And then you have to beg, it begs the question, uh, why didn't they put an entire uniform layer of felt because the great thing about felts non-woven felts because i've worked with them for 30 some odd years is you can get them in huge bolts why not cover the whole surface of the uh, stainless steel shell of the vehicle uh, with continuous felt and then attach the individual tiles on top of that so if I, the tiles I think they have off, done that too, and I don't know which one is the more recent method, and I don't know if they're doing one in one area and the other in the other. We also don't know if there's adhes adhesive attaching the uh, the felt to the skin. It doesn't, I just it have to assume that it's there for a reason, and, 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 and I'm pretty sure that the reason is not insulation because it's – well, I mean, it could be mechanical, right? You, you, you don't want the, uh, the tiles vibrating against the skin. It could, it could be that, but um, I think that – uh it the insulation it doesn't need the insulation right uh that will insulate enough to preserve the skin if it's there 
So if, if, the yeah, spec like general it. speculation has been that it, it it will also be like a backup layer if the tiles yeah. fail. And we haven't yeah. seen pieces of that washing up on the beach. Yeah, one, one thing I'll do, I, I got just a, a couple minutes remaining, is is do a heat transfer 101 class here really quickly to get everyone up, up to speed and what's going on, is that when it comes down to thermal management, what determines the actual temperature, the steady state temperature of a particular object is the amount of heat that it dissipates versus the amount that comes in. Yeah. So if the heat that you're shedding is equal to the heat that's coming in, then you're going to be at a at a steady state, and, th and that determines what your underlying temperature is. Now, when you yeah. go to transfer heat, there's three modes of transferring heat. One is contact, uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. And right. conduction is when you put your hand straight on the stove, okay? Convection is kind of like when your hand's above it and you can feel the warm air moving over it. And the radiation, of course, the glow that you, you feel between the two. And each one of them is in a different balance. So the temperature that you might be in a balance for radiation heating may be very different than what it is for conduction or convection. And it's the sum of all these things that sort of determines your underlying temperature. That's right. And when you go into space, you're trying to manage those different things. So once you get in the vacuum of space, there's really only one mode of being able to transfer uh, heat energy, and that's radiation, because you're not coming that's in right. contact with anything, and there's definitely no convection. There's nothing going to be blowing over. So you're trying to manage that. Now, anyone that knows that on a hot summer day, if you go walking barefoot out on the asphalt, your feet are going to be burning like crazy, okay? Because it's like really, really hot because black absorbs heat like crazy. Yeah. And as soon as you step on one of those white lines, it's like nice and cool, and suddenly your feet aren't burning anymore. That's because the white reflects heat very, very well. Even though the underlying uh, surface that you're there is probably very hot because around it has been very hot. So when it comes to managing this thing, there's this constant balance, this trick that you're trying to figure out. The thing about white surfaces is they're really good at reflecting heat. The other right. thing about them is they're really bad at dissipating heat. That's right. So, you, so you're trying to make this question, well, wait a minute. If it's if you want white to reflect the heat, why don't why aren't those tiles white? And it's like, well, it's because the heating of the tile is not coming from radiation. The heat is coming, in this case, from the friction of the atmosphere. That's right. Everything's getting heating up. Now, you are getting like a glowing plasma, which is radiating a little bit. But the reality is it's nothing compared to the frictional heating you're getting. Because that's why you get in the plasma, because of that frictional heating. So now what you want to do is dump that heat any way that you can. And the best way to dump that heat is to make the surface that is exposed to the vacuum of space or basically three degree Kelvin black because black yeah. actually not only absorbs heat, it dumps heat really well. So as far as it's concerned, that plasma is transparent to the energy it's trying to dump out. Yeah. It will glow red, but it's glowing. It. Now on the backside, you got to remember if you paint the backside black, that means it's going to radiate the heat towards the stainless steel, which you don't want. That's why you make it white. So it's not dumping anything towards the stainless steel because it cannot radiate that way. At the same time, the stainless steel is nice and shiny. And anything you shine in its way, it's going to shine it right back at you. So that's the reason why they're balancing the colors in there and why you make that black. And that's just I want to make sure everyone understands yeah. why these decisions and what the color is. Because mm -hmm. the lunar yeah. module, the reason why parts of the lunar mm -hmm. module were black is because they wanted to absorb heat in there to keep that part of it warm. There were right. other parts that they put the silver and the gold foil on there because they needed to dump it. And of course, the Apollo capsule, because they have cryo and everything in the back of the service module, that's the reason why it was silver, because they were more concerned about the sun heating up everything there, and they did everything to reflect it. So depending yes. on your systems, the temperatures you need, whether you're coming in contact with stuff, not coming in contact with it, determines the color. And I just want to make sure everyone understood why the tiles why they put that glaze? Because otherwise, that's the only reason for the glaze. Otherwise, they wouldn't put it on there. It's not to make it stronger yeah. or do anything else. It's just because they need to dump the heat. Yeah. Okay, Scott, I, I don't I have I, to go. Okay. <laughs> do, do you have a couple of minutes? Because I, I want a very quick reaction from you. Yep. Okay. This is Gwen. Uh, she mentioned something very interesting at the satellite conference in March. I want to play out a soundbite. Quick reaction from you before you go. Maybe I'll go a little bit further out. Um, we are going to roll out a capability, we call it plug and placer, basically commercialize our lasers to basically put on other satellites uh, systems. So I think that's pretty exciting. We'll roll that out um, actually with our new Polaris Dawn mission coming up here this summer on a Dragon capsule. So we'll connect Dragon to the internet, which would be pretty great. Um, and then. I'm, what I'm, you asked what we're most excited about, and I'm really looking forward to having 
communications to bases on the moon and uh, a Starlink around Mars. Well, exciting uh, future ahead, but you can't get to all of that without Starship. Um, so, Scott, before you go very quickly, what do you make of that comment? Well, first, it's interesting. Her background is basically the heat tile design. <laughs> you know, <that> <laughs> um, yeah, that was interesting because on in, yeah. uh, April 1st, this, the Starlink app suddenly <laughs> showed like this weird background. It showed your Starlinks actually on Mars. So it shows uh, how the series is about it. But I was not aware of that plug and plazer. I mean, that sounds really cool that you could just start putting on any satellite, not just a Starlink one, which means any vehicle that you're putting into orbit, you will now have the advantage of being able to use Starlink as communication. You don't need these expensive ground stations anymore. I mean, that that is a, you know another game changer, and obviously another source of revenue for uh, for Starlink. No doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. And let's one, one other thing that I want to I want to yeah. yeah. Sorry. What was that? So Scott, when you said her background is uh, is heat shields, uh, her her actual you know work background. I, I thought you were talking about her her actual work background because it was she was a thermal analyst who was who, who did. Uh, like simulations of uh, shuttle tile uh, heating, so that's <laughs> oh, that's interesting. No, that's just a you know, it's like oh. ironic that the the display behind her was hexagonal just because they probably right, said right. that was a design. Thought, but it's like, well, doesn't that look like the, the heat tiles design? Yeah, I caught both of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and with that, I, I look forward to hearing the the rest of this discussion. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I well, thank you. Well. I know you have to go. Airports and traffic, traffic, you know, traffic. they they make no time for <laughs> man. Yeah, okay. Bye, Scott. <laughs> so, uh, let me pull up your your profiles uh, before you go, so people can follow you. This is, uh, of course, um, this is Scott Walter. Uh, he's going ballistic five on X. Uh, this is uh, Doctor Ed Pope and Ozan Bellick. Yeah. And of course, um, guys, thank you so much. Yeah. It's been wonderful uh, having you back on. And, uh, you know, we've got to do this again before IFT4 or as soon as but, we get maybe after. more. <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, been, <okay. laughs> it's been uh, it, it's been, it's been great. I, I, I do want to say before we go uh, that, you know, that that, that me uh, material that Ed has uh, pulled up, uh, Carbon Z-Rock, I do really think that that would be amazing to see on, on Starship. I hope that that's kind of where they go. I mean, I, th I think that that's, that seems more promising in terms of vehicle performance and reliability than uh, this combination of silica and and maybe pika in the future for the interplanetary yeah. stuff. Um, that'd be that'd oh, be I fun. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Ryden, for organizing. Thank you so much, Ed. Really, uh, and Ozan. Yeah, it's just just so much fun. You don't want to end this unless you want to get stuck in traffic. All right. <laughs> Till next time. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.